Seems to be fairly late. Good day, wonderful human being, and welcome to another edition of Inside, Inside the Autiverse. The Autiverse. Facts, facts, things, facts, things, things, things happening. How does autism affect your life day to day? If you've been a part of my community for a while, you'll know that I'm very much on the neurodiversity bandwagon, and I like being autistic, but it can present some difficulties day to day in real life. This is actually a pretty common question that I get asked whenever I meet anyone out in the, the big wide world. They'll usually ask me how does autism affect me? And what they mean is, how negative is it? What, what do you struggle with? Have you got any weird things that you're going to do, just like uh, jump out at them and scare them a little bit? Yes, that's what autism does. We all hail, we all look at this idea of unmasking, we're like, this is what we need to do as autistic people to sort of fight the neuronormative society that we find ourselves in to assert our autistic identity into the world. And I am, for all intents and purposes, an unmasked individual. Meaning, I do not try to act like I'm not autistic. And by doing that, you can imagine, brings a lot of challenges. So join me. Join me to cover everything from general life stuff, to sensory things, to emotional pain people. I'm gonna do it fast. But before that, let me just take a little sippy sippy. <clears throat> I think that went down the wrong hole. Becoming very Yorkshire in this this video. Maybe I'm just returning to my roots. Life as as an autistic person, just, just as me being autistic, doesn't really have many negative effects on me. The reason why things can be quite difficult for me and perhaps different to other people is due to two things. My medication, my sedative medication, my antidepressants, and my mental health. Both of those things have a really big impact on my overall functioning as a human being. If my mental health is good or, or satisfactory, things are good. There's, there's no, no nothing to complain about. But I do not live in this world. I am still mentally ill. <laughs> I am still autistic. And the way that my life pans out as a mentally ill autistic person <laughs> Why am I introducing myself in that way? Looks very different to people who just struggle with mental illness. Number one, let's talk about the life stuff. Let's get down to the, the nitty gritty of the situation. The big one on everybody's minds, in, on just my mind, I'm kind of projecting that on you. Executive dysfunction, of course. Things related to managing my own life. My brain, time, organizing things keeping track of things, remembering things. All of that stuff is very, very difficult for me. If you're wondering about what exactly this might look like, this would be things like hygiene, food preparation, time blindness. You can think particularly sort of in the workplace or going for meetings or, or swiping through and, and matching with that very attractive lady. I miss her so much. Executive function definitely is the main thing that I struggle with the most as an autistic person. It is listed under the autism diagnosis and also under ADHD and depression and OCD and a whole host of other things. But for a lot of autistic people, we can struggle with this aspect of life, meaning that those little tasks, those life tasks that we need to get done, don't always get done. A lot of people have the misinterpretation that this means I cannot, I, ca I cannot prepare food. I cannot take care of myself. I can do it. I just can't do it consistently over a long period of time. And it's not the easiest thing to talk about because people tend to look down on people who cannot fulfill these things as it's kind of expected that if you are an independent adult that you should be able to do things, but I am disabled. The organization, communications and self-advocacy parts can be particularly difficult, especially in the workplace. With not being able to organize myself and what I'm doing, having the sense of time blindness to the point where I'm just always five minutes behind on everything that I need to be done. It's annoying. It, it really gets in the way of me getting through life and it also puts me at risk in terms of my employment. A large part of a lot of jobs is replying to emails, communicating with fellow humans. I cannot for the life of me keep up with emails. Another pretty 
annoying aspect, there's self-advocacy aspects of it. I'm sure many of you can relate to this if you are autistic or if you have any sort of difference. Generally, people don't really have that kind of baseline level of understanding in order to take your needs or your differences seriously. When you're autistic, you do, ha you do have to do a lot of self-advocacy or you need to mask or you need to just get yourself out of a situation. Self-advocating would be things like explaining aspects of myself being autistic, standing up for myself in situations where me being disabled and me being autistic has made something difficult or made something complicated or upset somebody or got, got on someone's nerves. When people don't really understand what it's like to be autistic and when people see this kind of outward persona that, that is me <laughs> and and the way that I communicate and socialize and the stuff that I've done online, they kind of expect everything else to be all golden and good, but I have a very, very spiky profile. So it does not look like that. Some things I'm very, very good at doing and other things I'm just absolutely awful at. Those things that I'm not very good at are usually the focal points of any like point of contention that anyone would have with me in the workplace. They don't think that I need the support. They don't understand it. They can't relate to the reasons behind it, the feelings that might pop up. And when that happens, the ideal scenario is that you communicate that and that you get everything done and dusted. But we do not live in a perfect world and not everybody has the level of autism education which would be apt for that kind of situation. This isn't to say I'm slagging off any workplaces because to be honest, a lot of the places that I have gone to work at, they've been absolutely great, very understanding. It's incredibly difficult to self-advocate in a situation where you are being paid by somebody, where you are employed by them. And there is some kind of background awareness in yourself that knows that this is something that you've experienced before, something that most neurotypicals will have an issue with and it's kind of balancing those ideas in your head and thinking, okay, I didn't mean to do this and this isn't something that I wanted to do and I would really like to be able to do this properly, but I just can't. And you're balancing that idea with sort of these expectations that society is putting onto you and self-advocating is the ideal but it's not always something that you can do, especially if you have to do it a lot. Another aspect of this executive dysfunction would be train travel. Usually, I'm pretty good with trains. I've done a lot of traveling in my life. I went abroad, I backpacked, sort of jumping from plane to plane to bus to bus to train to train. I've had a lot of experience when it comes to travel, but especially during times where I have not traveled for a long time, trains can sometimes be a little bit of a trigger. And usually it's not much of an issue, but I have got into some situations where I've had a shutdown or I've had a meltdown and I've missed my stop and I panicked and I've had to go talk to the train conductors and the staff and say, hey, look, try to communicate some way. I'm distressed, I'm not drunk, I'm not on drugs, I'm an autistic man. Usually they're pretty good with it. Sometimes not so much, they kind of look at you weirdly. You're saying like, there's a six foot man, six foot three bodybuilder with a beard coming up to talk to me and he looks cracked out of his mind. <laughs> so those can be difficult. Usually it's fine. I've had some incidents where I've kind of broken down a little bit when it came to traveling. Another massive piece of the puzzle here is sleep routine. Now, sleep hygiene, has been highlighted by a lot of sleep researchers and actually in, in one of my previous podcasts that I did with Dr. Megan Neff, we were talking a lot about sleep and how this sleep hygiene, the things that you do around your sleep, the environment that you put yourself in is important to kind of get, in, get into the routine of. And you know me, I love routines. The bane of my existence is transitions. <laughs> doesn't matter how well I construct a routine, sometimes my brain just doesn't want to have it. Sometimes I cannot transition myself from one place to another and it ends up just fumbling my entire day. It's obviously going to be exacerbated a lot due to the medication that I'm on because it's a sedative, I take it at night, I wake up, I feel like I'm just had like I've been drinking for about two nights in a row and I wake up and I have like this crazy stupor, this this otherworldly feeling of just sluggishness. I'm not just talking about generally waking up in the morning. If, you, if you've ever been on this medication, drop it down in the comments. <laughs> Let other people know. Um, it's it's horrific to, to try and live when you're on that med. And as you can imagine, if you are not waking up on time, you're not going to sleep, 
a lot of things during the day, the next day, are gonna be messed up. Routine's gonna be all over the place. And I love my routine. And it keeps me feeling safe and certain and calm and collected. And I like it. But it's, it's quite often fairly difficult to keep to it. So let's move away from the executive function kind of life side of things, because that, that basically is probably the main thing that causes me the most trouble. The second thing that I could think of would be the sensory things. My sensory profile is basically I'm hypersensitive to everything. Everything just feels brighter, sounds louder, has more of an impact on my mental state. I'm living in a world that's just jacked up a little bit on overall sensory input. The only things that I'm hyposensitive to, so insensitive, would be my vestibular and proprioceptive stuff, so my balance, my awareness of my body and space. Basically means that I'm clumsy and uncoordinated, but I do make up for that considering that I have been lifting weights and doing taekwondo for a long time. I trip over a lot, I fumble a lot, but I always catch myself. That's, that's, that's the key. <laughs> the sensory profile can make it difficult to go out into the world. If I'm feeling particularly high anxiety, again, that's that mental health coming in, it's gonna be a lot more difficult to go outside. I'm gonna get these kind of agoraphobic like feelings of just wanting to stay in my bubble, not wanting to go outside. I might have some friends that I want to see, but you know, it. I just feel too overstimulated from the environment and I need to take lots of breaks. And it, it's more of an annoyance. It's not really something that stops me from doing anything because I just, I won't let it stop me from doing things, but it means that I have to wear a lot of sensory supports and it means that I need to take breaks, particularly when I'm in very noisy, busy environments. Another aspect to the sensory profile would be interoception, the ability to be aware of your bodily signs. Typically hunger and thirst. Thirst, as you can imagine, it's not a good thing. You, you, you need to stay topped up and hydrated. And when you have a weakened signal, a first, you're going to be in this constant state of dehydration unless you have reminders or unless you have some kind of system around you or a really, really fat water bottle next to you all the time and just, just constantly drinking. It's, it's either one or the other. I'm either overhydrated and I keep having to make trips to the bathroom or I'm just dehydrated. There's like often no in between and whilst it doesn't have a massive impact on my day, it can definitely contribute to me not feeling so good, not performing as well at the gym, not feeling as mentally acute, perhaps a little bit tired. And the food aspect of it can also be an issue, as you can imagine. I've, I've been a couple of days before not eating at all. It doesn't really prop up in my brain, especially if I've got like a little project that I'm tapping away at and trying to edit. And, and maybe for anybody who is thinking, oh, okay, that doesn't sound too 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 bad to be honest like i'm wanting to lose a few pounds you know shed a few globules of fat the issue there is that i also don't have a very strong sense of hunger so like strong strong sense of fullness rather i can eat i can eat and eat and eat and eat and the thing that stops me from eating if i just continue and i'm just not cognizant of it at all would be my stomach hurts i feel sick you can imagine the sort of ties in there with eating disorders, things like anorexia, perhaps with the hunger, sort of not feeling the hunger signs, maybe make it a little bit easier for someone to get into that state. But if we're talking about me, generally at this point in my life, the binge eating is definitely like a really, really big thing for me. Again, coming in there with the medication, the metazapine, the bane of my existence, but also something that helps me get to sleep, helps my anxiety. That basically spikes your hunger as well. So you mix in proclivity for binge eating disorder, interoceptive difficulties, plus an appetite stimulant. I become like a ravenous creature. I'm, I'm not even lying. I become a gremlin. I become a little autistic Tom gremlin running about and scouring the fridge for anything to eat. And I'll eat anything. Thankfully, I've got a little bit more of a handle on that stuff. I've sort of reined in the binge eating a little bit, but it does prop up now and again in my life. Number three, let us talk about emotions. Anger, fear, jealousy, sadness, and even happiness. All of these things can be blunted for me because I am an alexithymic individual, and in fact, a lot of autistic people are alexithymic too. It's also got some tie-ins to PTSD and CPTSD. A lot of people with that profile also tend to experience alexithymia, which is 
basically this this blunting of your emotions it's not that you don't feel emotions it's just that your perception of your own emotional state is just it's, it's just a bit blunted it's just a bit harder to see like you got foggy glasses on it's basically the ability to notice and categorize your own emotions you might even notice that you're feeling a certain way feeling different but not know exactly what that is it's just daily trying to manage your own emotions can just be an absolute minefield it's like most days if my alexithymia is just very intense i can i can spend ages just trial and error trying to figure out exactly why i'm feeling a certain thing and usually the people around me have a better awareness of why exactly i might be feeling that way but it just doesn't connect in my brain together i just can't make that connection it's like the line is just it's a bit swiggled all over the place. But it doesn't mean that I'm completely unaware of my emotional state. There's actually a lot of things that I've done myself. It's not been something that I've been prescribed or worked through with a psychologist. It's something that I've done myself. And that is looking for bodily signs. So if I'm anxious, usually I feel a lot of tension in my legs. I feel like there's ants crawling on my bones. Things related to like breathing rates. All of those kind of physical reactions to stress to to adrenaline to cortisol those are the things that i look for i don't know that i'm anxious i can't tell that i'm feeling anxious but the results of being anxious are apparent if i'm able to look for them this has really impacted my experience of therapy things that are out there all of the strategies that you could you can look for that the psychologists give you require you to have a, an awareness of what you're feeling like they give you sort of a list of things to do when you're anxious that list is not so great when you only know that you're anxious when you're sort of borderline having a meltdown it's pretty useless to a certain degree. As well as making it quite easy for me to talk about deeply traumatic, deeply impactful things without feeling much, without having much visible signs of feelings, without being, being aware of any feelings that are coming up. And that makes it very, very difficult when you are going into therapy to deal with some deep-seated emotional issues. The shutdowns and meltdowns is obviously like a really big part of this. I have meltdowns. I have shutdowns. Shutdowns are a lot, 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 a lot more common for me in, in adulthood. When I was younger, I used to experience a lot of meltdowns. And I have experienced a lot of meltdowns in adulthood too. Just not in the past few years or so. I've had shutdowns in public with people that I don't know. Not being able to communicate what I need or where I need to go or what I need to do to keep myself safe. In meltdowns, I generally just experience like generally just experience <laughs> just generally just experience extreme amounts of emotional distress <laughs> extreme amounts of anxiety just a little bit you know just a little bit of extreme anxiety although it's not something that i've done in a long time i did used to hit myself during meltdowns it's something that that tended to come on from a combination of the meltdown as well as other people continuing to exacerbate that meltdown but also my current feelings if i'm feeling very depressed and i'm feeling a lot of self-hatred sort of internal low self-esteem that kind of stuff tends to happen a lot more did tend to happen a lot more frequently for me i'm sure i could give loads and loads of different examples of different various environments that you could find yourself in a meltdown or shutdown none of which especially when they're in public is fun and good the the, the sort of shame that I feel sometimes when it comes to shutdowns and meltdowns really really impacts like relationships that I have with people. People, 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 neurotypicals, holistic individuals. The biggest thing that I struggle with when it comes to people is friendship maintenance, watering the flower, making sure that little friendship flower is topped up regularly, meaning text messages usually these days. I hate text messages. I hate messaging. I've had a few friendships which have, or quite a few friendships, and even relationships to a certain degree that have fizzled out because my social battery is low. I just can't handle that amount of interaction. It's not even a level of interaction that makes me happy. That mismatch between what I want in terms of communication and what other people want can sometimes be very very high and if it is and the other person does not listen to me and does not trust that this is not me ignoring them or me like replacing them with another friend or like another relationship it tends to fizzle out a fair bit it's happened it does it does happen over 
long, long period of time, it's going to have some, some real effects on my overall functioning, my overall anxiety levels. And it's also going to be, make me kind of resent a little bit having to continually communicate with somebody if I don't want to. The second aspect of this is the thin slice judgments, which is very, very apparent for me because I'm unmasked. I do not communicate <laughs> directly. I don't enjoy it. The issue there is that the majority of people speak that way, communicate that way, and also I do not give off any indirect signs of communication intentionally. So if someone's not direct, if someone doesn't speak directly, if someone doesn't, isn't comfortable speaking to me directly, if they see that I don't make as much eye contact as most people, I don't do a lot of the kind of neurotypical stuff that, that people do when they like first meet people, if my body language is different to how I'm communicating, if you know, a whole host of different things. Uh, people can very quickly judge me as something that I'm not. Some people even judge me as being shy. I do not experience any social anxiety. I guess this is not really much of a negative because usually the people who tend to make those snap quick judgments about someone's character based on very very little information don't tend to be the type of person who is wanting to understand someone who's different to be curious and it's very akin to that aspect of like being polarizing of wearing your heart on your sleeve you know just speaking directly being honest about what you think and what you feel and what you want and some people they like that, that makes them feel comfortable, they're like, they can ask me something and I'm just honest about it, they don't have to wonder about it, but some people don't like that, some people want a lot of softness, a lot of indirectness, some people do not take kindly. We don't take kindly to your types in here! Basically they're making judgments about me in a thin way. The next aspect is the romantic relationships aspects of things. Alexithymia can be an issue. You can imagine that having executive dysfunction in a relationship can also be a point of frustration for the other party. The directness could be taken well most of the time but sometimes not and there is a pretty strong trend that I've seen in a lot of people. Not everybody but the, the majority of people that I've been in a relationship with or been in a, in a friendship with, they forget that I'm autistic. It just flies under the radar at important points in conversations, especially when emotions are high and if it's a confrontation or an argument. And overall that makes things quite difficult and it makes things quite tedious to, to, to have to continue to self-advocate, continue to explain yourself in the way that you work and the way that you're different to someone over and over and over again. And this isn't to say that I'm bashing people who do forget about things like this. I know that I'm different. I know I've I've experienced with it. Most people don't don't understand how I work and I, most people I have to communicate stuff to and self-advocate for constantly. And I wish that more people had education on this, more people had contact and more people understand more about autism from like a young age. If that was freely available and just there, in most people's lives during like their education that would be so great <laughs> but that's not the world that we're living in all of these things that i've talked about although they are negative this is the topic of the video and a lot of these things don't tend to be too much of an issue when my mental health is good when i'm medication free and also not mentally <laughs> and i'm missing out a really huge part of my story, my experience in life, which is the positive aspects, the things that being autistic has helped me with, the things that I like about being autistic. I don't want to be anyone else. I do not want to be holistic. I don't want to not be autistic. I hope that comes across clearly here. I'm going to go cry into a pillow and painfully reflect on the state of my life.